and it's now live. Okay. Yeah, so the emails went through to some people because people are joining, so that's good. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Culver. I'm the director of the Center for Journalism Ethics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have a few people continuing to join us, so we're just going to hang on for a little bit longer um, as uh, people um, begin to uh, uh, click on their email and join us. So we're just going to hold on for maybe two minutes more. Hi, Michelle. It's great to see you too. I see you in the chat. Um, we appreciate working with you guys as well. Very happy to have um, WBA folks here. Uh, just so everyone knows, when you're commenting, um, the, the chat will default to send only to all panelists, but most participants want to send it to all panelists and participants. So you'll see down, um, there's, a, there's a little blue button that you can click on and change it to all panelists and attendees. Um, and that way everybody will see your comments, not just Howard and, and me. All right, I think we're I think we're ready to go. Some people may join us um, as we are uh, moving through, but let's not waste time. We're all on deadline, right? <laughs> so again, for those who just joined, I'm Katie Culver. I run the Ethics Center here at UW Madison, and I am delighted to welcome you to this webinar today. Um, Howard Hardy, who has been doing really important work for our election integrity project, is my guest here today. Um, we're going to start off with um, just a few slides to note how we got into this project and who has been helping us. So Krista, if you'd like to um, trigger the slides, that would be great. There we go. Okay, excellent. Um, so as I said before, we're here um, today as part of our election integrity project. Um, this 
This is a project that um, we started up this summer as we began to think about how best to help local news outlets in Wisconsin um, empower citizens. So um, when it comes to um, the integrity of their vote, their voting rights, what could we provide that would help any reporters um, to uh, do this work effectively? So we um, got together with the um, Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, which um, uses the handle Wisconsin Watch. So they're at wisconsinwatch.org and um, decided that the Center for Journalism Ethics would focus on creating um, two toolkits, uh, one for reporters, one for citizens. And then as we got into this work, um, we began working more closely with First Draft, which is an effort that Howard has been involved in um, uh, for quite some time now. So it's been, it's been a good, uh, it's been a great um, partnership with both of those entities. And what we're going to talk about primarily today is our um, responsible reporting toolkit. So this is how um, you can go about coverage of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, so this is a, an example of um, what Howard has um, been working on in this toolkit. And don't worry, we have resources for you, links for you to be able to access the toolkit, um, and we'll send out follow-up um, email with other um, with other links and resources as well. So this is all, as I said before, produced by the um, uh, Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism and our Center for Journalism Ethics in collaboration with First Draft. Um, the, the, we've received support from the Craig Newmark Philanthropies uh, to do this work and I'm really grateful because it would not have been possible um, without that support. So um, here's one of the uh, slices from the toolkit. So Howard saying, don't repeat the myth. <laughs> um, this is your toolkit for covering information Disorder, which I think is a good way that um, Howard has framed things. So here are the elements of the toolkit um, that we're going to we're going to talk about some of them today. Um, how do you measure what the tipping point is when you're covering information disorder? So the, the very central question for all of us, I think, is when do we report on it and when do we just let it slide? Um, we know from research, a lot of it being done in our school of journalism and mass communication, that disinformation is really hard to debunk. So how can we go about that work? Um, how to handle misinformation in your own reporting? Sometimes that's your reporting being used um, in ways that you did not intend it and completely out of context. Um, how can you approach your your social media um, activities with um, integrity and with focus on counteracting mis and disinformation. Howard points to seven forms of mis and disinformation and gives, um, gives you some tools for monitoring and verifying information. All right, so Howard, let's jump in. Um, basically, I want to do this like an interview <laughs> to, to uh, have you share your work with us. So how did you exactly go about um, developing these recommendations and, and, um, and putting together this toolkit? Sure, thanks, Katie. And also, thanks to everyone for, for being here. I really appreciate your interest in this really important subject. Um, so it had been obvious to me well before the calendar turned over to 2020 that misinformation on social media was going to be one of the most important factors in this election year. Um, I think it's kind of hard to overstate how damaging uh, misinformation has been for a public discourse and our democracy. And as a reporter who is dedicated to accuracy and truth telling and one who lives in a really important swing state, no less, I decided that I essentially couldn't ignore the falsehoods uh, spreading in my own backyard. So when the opportunity ar arose to join a fellowship with First Draft, which is an international journalism group that trains reporters how to identify and track misinformation, I thought it was a great opportunity to try and make a difference here in Wisconsin. So these report, uh, toolkits that I've produced with help from Wisconsin Watch and the Center for Journalism Ethics are the products of monitoring uh, state-specific misinfo on social media since February. I've had several months now to kind of get a feel for how misinfo tends to spread in Wisconsin and try to kind of identify patterns in the chaos. And all of that definitely informed how I approached putting the toolkits together. So what are the what are the big picture takeaways here? What are the things that um, you think are really going to pop up for people when they when they encounter the toolkit? Yeah, you, you already mentioned one of them. Um, I think the, the most important takeaway for reporters is, is getting into habits of mind like measuring the tipping point, which is a concept developed by First Draft and discussed at length in the toolkit. 
and uh, weighing the harm that disinformation campaigns could inflict on vulnerable communities. Um, so somebody lying on Twitter isn't necessarily newsworthy in and of itself. Um, it happens all the time, and you definitely don't want to call more attention to um, the, the problematic content by reporting on it prematurely. Um, you have to demonstrate that the falsehood has the potential to reach a wide audience and uh, do some sort of real world damage before you even think about reporting on it. And until you've reached that point, it's better to watch and wait and, and take plenty of screenshots. Um, on several occasions in my own reporting, I've captured images that ended up informing my stories down the road, even though I didn't know they would at the time. Um, another thing I think it's really important to understand is the trumpet of amplification, which is another concept developed by First Draft and also discussed at the toolkit. Um, it basically holds that, that bad actors are, are counting on reporters from tr traditional media outlets to amplify their messages by repeating them in their reporting, even if it's in the context of like a brief, uh, debunk or a fact check style story. So um, it's just really important to know that, that we're often the, the, the target of mis and disinformation campaigns. Yeah, could you say a little bit more about um, what you mean by vulnerable communities? So, you know, efforts to um, throw disinformation at vulnerable communities. What does that mean? Why, why should we be thinking about that? Um, yeah, it's just always really important to uh, be aware that uh, 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 like certain communities are, are less uh, media literate or have less access to uh, the digital tools that allows us to like navigate this this crazy uh, world of mis and disinformation online and that um, that's one of the, the things that could influence your, your measuring of the tipping point. Just like if you see a, a campaign that is targeted at a community that uh, may not have those tools then that's just like extra alarming. Yeah, sometimes they, they, you know, we play to um, generational differences um, in understanding how things, you know, how we light fires on social media or particular passion points, things that really matter to us are the things that we're most vulnerable about when it comes to um, mis and disinformation. What can each of us be doing right now um, to focus on a healthier news environment, especially when it comes to social media? Mm -hmm. um. Well, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that we all play a role in amplifying mis and disinformation online and that we can all be better about thinking before we share content or commenting on an inflammatory uh, social media post that is getting a lot of attention. It's just good to recognize that all of those actions uh, serve to elevate that com uh, content and kind of ensure that more people than ever will see it if, if we're engaging with it as well. So for reporters specifically, we need to be thinking about how our stories can be mischaracterized on social media and to be aware that almost all content that we produce, no matter how well sourced and fairly reported we think it is, is um, you know, likely to be routed into these really deeply partisan channels online. I've, I've had that happen to my stories as well, and it can be really discouraging. Um, that said, I think it's really important for reporters to kind of like stay above the fray rather than jumping into really rancorous uh, exchanges on social media. Like everybody's a publisher in the digital age and everybody has an opinion that they seem hell bent on sharing. And I would argue that seeing a reporter kind of like rolling around in the muck with everybody else can be kind of damaging to their credibility. So one of the recommendations in this toolkit is to spar with misinformed users cautiously um, there, there are certain situations where speaking up is warranted and, in fact, helpful for everybody who else comes across the content online. But I would say that it's usually better to just focusing on to focus on researching your story and, and just kind of letting your work work speak for itself. Uh, so I tend to be a little bit old school. <laughs> So, you know, very active early on um, on social media, but now sort of feeling that fatigue of, you know, what's the, what's the next tool? So I'm not someone who um, has read it as my front page. Mm -hmm. I uh, just really don't understand the value of TikTok. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so, so as someone, you know, who uses things, but only for my own purposes, why should I care? Like, why should I, why should it matter to me that this mis and disinformation is going on on those channels? 
Yeah, that's a really good point. I think a lot of people identify with that. And I'm kind of an old crotchety soul myself. So, um, <laughs> hey, I never uh, said I was crotchety. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely me. I, yeah. you know, for a long time, I just uh, kind of purposely turned away from social media because I, I disliked it so much, um, especially as a reporter who cares about, um, you know, telling the truth. I, I just found it like personally offensive. So I just didn't even go there. But I came to, to, to believe that this is such an existential problem for journalism and our electoral system and the general public's perception of reality that reporters, like even ones who would rather not spend much time on social media, kind of have an obligation to like venture into this, this like really poisonous environment and report back. Like if a, if a reporter's highest purpose is, is getting as close to the truth as possible I just don't think that we can ignore this like fire hose of misinformation that's flooding the social media space. It's kind of our job to like understand um, wh what exactly is is poisoning the well and to produce um, public service journalism to counter these strains of misinformation that are posing such a great risk to our, our shared knowledge and our, our democracy. I think that's kind of like the basic job description. So the, I think the fire hose um, metaphor is a good one or analogy. I never know the difference <laughs> between the two. But, you know, yes, we may have a responsibility to be monitoring all of this and reporting. Um, but, you know, if you drink from a fire hose, you run the risk of drowning, right? So how do you deal with the fatigue and frustration of mis and disinformation? How, how do you find productive ways forward from this, this muck and this mire? Mm -hmm. Also another really good question. Um, I mean, you and I were just talking about this the other day. It's really easy to feel um, uh, very dim and gloom. I often struggle to feel okay about the state of our democracy and of public discourse. It can be very discouraging. And it often feels like there isn't much to be optimistic about, but um, through the course of, of working with First Draft and Wisconsin Watch and also um, the Center for Journalism Ethics, I've, I've realized over this this past year that you can really only focus on what you have control over and it, that kind of applies to your personal life as well but um, you know bad influencers are, are going to keep spewing co toxic content uh, the social platforms themselves are going to continue elevating really emo emotionally evocative material these are things that we don't have any control over all, all we can really do is um, look for misinformation that is posing a specific threat to our communities, um, flag it when necessary, and also be proactive about getting good information to readers and listeners and viewers. Um, and getting more specific, um, I think one of, one of the more heartening things that I've learned this year is the power, powerful potential of the pre-bunk, um, which is another concept discussed in the toolkit that I think is really encouraging. It's, it's a story that attempts to get out in front of false information that people are likely to see ahead of a scheduled event like an election. So you could let your audiences know that they're gonna see posts attacking the credibility of mail carriers and elections uh, officials in the weeks ahead. Um, you can discuss the general tactics that bad actors use rather than attempting to address specific strains of misinformation, which can be more helpful because it's kind of like inoculating the public um, uh, against these, uh, you know, really toxic forms of content that could kind of like infect their minds. And the research shows us that um, conspiracy ideation is really difficult to undo after the fact with a corrective piece. Um, it's far better to try to like kind of nip it in the bud. So I see that as one really encouraging way that reporters can do something productive regarding the bad stuff that they see on Facebook and Twitter in their feeds. Yeah, I think the pre-bunk is one of the more powerful aspects of the of the toolkit or one of the more powerful Pre elements that you mentioned. Um, and I, the, when I was going through the toolkit, it just reminded me of, um, you know, when you're dealing with some kind of um, virus, having a vaccination in advance of the virus um, can be an incredibly powerful tool. So very hard to, um, you know, combat the flu once you get it. But mm -hmm. if you have the flu vaccine in advance and a pre-bunk is, is essentially like that. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, you mentioned that, that 
we have, we have this obligation and sometimes you can get down. It can feel dim and gloomy. Um, but one of the things that the Center for Journalism Ethics wants to try to do is create this community of practice in Wisconsin so that we're here having these kinds of things um, and supporting each other. And, that, and that's what the toolkit essentially was about. Um, what digital tools do you use? These are mentioned in the toolkit, but let's talk a little bit about the digital tools you use to track mis and disinformation and how, the, how accessible those are for the average you know, local reporter in a newsroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are uh, a couple of tools that are really essential if you're interested in monitoring social media for misinformation, or really even if you're not interested in that specific sphere and you just want to get more detailed with your, your research and your reporting. Uh, most of us only really see the bleeding edge of the toxic content that's out there. And there are so many in, uh, pages and groups kind of out of our view that are serving as breeding grounds for the worst of the worst content. And unfortunately, that's where you need to go. Um, so for monitoring Twitter, you're going to want to use TweetDeck, which is, in my experience, kind of visually intimidating at first, because you're basically looking at like a dozen different Twitter feeds that are running in columns directly adjacent to each other. So it kind of looks like the matrix when all the data is like pouring down. Um, but it's actually really quite intuitive. Like if you know how to use Twitter, then you can figure out how to use Tweet TweetDeck in really short order. Um, it's an especially powerful tool if you learn how to string a Boolean search query together. And that's kind of getting into the weeds, but we do have a section about Booleans in our toolkit that you can check out. And we also refer to First Draft's really comprehensive uh, guide of how to um, develop Boolean search queries. But they're really useful um, as a research tool that you can use outside of Twitter as well. You can just plug it into a Google search. Um, for monitoring Facebook and Reddit, uh, CrowdTangle is the way to go. Um, unfortunately, it's not nearly as easy to use as TweetDeck, kind of kind of like Facebook itself. It's not really easy to search and has a bunch of quirks that you have to get used to. Um, you, you also can't use a Boolean search query in CrowdTangle, which is um, limiting and frustrating. But I will say this, uh, it provides a way to keep tabs on Facebook and Reddit uh, pages that otherwise would be pretty much impossible. And it has this really important feature, uh, which is the overperformance metric. Um, that shows you whether a post is getting more likes and shares and comments than is typical uh, for a particular uh, page or account, which is interesting for the reporter who's looking for social media content that is getting people really riled up. Um, it's a good way to find emotional and inflammatory content that's getting a lot of attention. And the last tool that I would like to mention is just a general reverse image search. Uh, reverse image search. This is really essential. Like I, I feel like everybody, not just reporters, should really know how to do this. It's basically just seeing where an image has already appeared online. And that can be really illuminating if you suspect that you're seeing an old image that's used out of context, um, which is an increasingly common tactic that we're seeing. Um, I use 10 i but it doesn't really matter which service you use. It's just like a really quick and dirty way of determining whether a post is trying to mislead you. And it only takes like five seconds. All you have to do is right click the image, save it to your desktop and upload it to 10 i and then you can see where else the image has appeared. And even Google reverse image search, um, you know, we had a situation um, just a few weeks ago with all the controversy over the postal service and an image went viral of stacks of, um, of uh, mailboxes being, you know, hauled away in Wisconsin when it turned out it was actually a place a business where they refurbish mailboxes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, a very quick reverse image search showed you exactly where that image had come from. Um, so I want to ask in reporting on the um, mis and disinformation that you've been doing since February, are there any themes, particularly here in Wisconsin, um, mm -hmm. that you're seeing that reporters and, and um, editors and news directors should know about? Yeah, and there's a, a couple big picture things. Um, first of all, I think it's been really eye opening to have watched a Facebook group like Wisconsinites Against uh, Excessive Quarantine start off as this like anti lockdown form and then morph into this like really massive multi purpose platform for misinformation. It's, it's like become a place where people just go to air grievances related to COVID or the elections or just general culture war type stuff. And what's incredible is that nearly everything posted in this channel is false or misleading in some way. And it has almost 120,000 members. So 
that's a, a massive audience on par with many of the traditional news outlets here in Wisconsin. And I think that really underscores how um, influential uh, face, Facebook can be in promoting falsehoods. And I think we should probably start talking about Facebook, not as this like passive blameless platform where people say some stuff, but like as an active source of harmful content. Um, another thing that I would like to note is how much of the disinformation that I've seen has followed this top-down pattern where it's planted by social media influencers with these really big digital audiences. And then you see it kind of trickle down as a talking point that you see reappear in comment threads all over the place. Um, you see this with politicians, uh, of course, but you also see it a lot with talk show radio hosts. And, and that's one thing that I've found really alarming. Like on the national level, you have Rush Limbaugh and like Sean Hannity pushing these falsehoods, but they get fact checked all the time by Politico and Snopes and factcheck.org and so on. But on the state level, nobody is really fact checking these Wisconsin equivalents to Rush Limbaugh. They're just freely pushing disinformation without uh, other voices stepping in on a regular basis. So um, yeah, that's just really alarming. And it makes me think that Wisconsin could really use a dedicated fact checking organization or like a Wisconsin-based news organization that had like an arm of their uh, of their business model that was just dedicated to fact checking, would, that would just be like extremely valuable. So well, we do have the Politifact effort here, and there is I should mention in the School of Journalism um, a course that teaches fact checking that pr um, produces something called the Observatory. So, but I but I agree with you that we. Um, that there's certainly more that could be done. I, I just want to let the audience know um, in about five minutes, I'm going to open it up um, for your questions. So if you could throw those into the chat um, and a reminder, please make it so um, click the little blue um, scroll bar so that you are posing your question to all panelists and attendees, not just uh, to, to we as the panelists. Um, so what are the big concerns out of 2016, of course, was foreign interference um, and the impact of foreign actors. Are you seeing any of that now? Yes, I, I have seen some evidence of Russian produced content being planted in Wisconsin groups like um, the new Milwaukee peaceful protest for change. Um, you'll sometimes see it, like a Facebook account based in Russia drop a really inflammatory video of like police brutality and pages like that to intentionally generate outrage. Um, my research partner with First Draft, Keenan Chen, he's a really talented researcher. He speaks uh, Mandarin and he just discovered a Wisconsin-based QAnon group on Facebook that is spreading misinformation in Chinese and, th and that's a really interesting finding that we haven't seen before um, very recently that we're digging into this week. So yes, we have seen like a, a, a little bit of foreign interference, you could say, but um, in general, we just really need to do away with the notion that disinformation is coming uh, exclusively, exclusively from Russian or Chinese bots. Like the vast majority of disinformation is being produced domestically by people with ideological motives, like right here in our state. And they've adopted many of those same tactics that were being used by Russian operatives in 2016. So it's kind of like that movie Scream when it's revealed that the, the killer is calling from inside the house. That's an <laughs> analogy that I like to use. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and it's, that's really tough for us, um, us to deal with, but, but only amplifies the significance of local news media right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how critically important they are. They are the most trusted news media. So I, uh, I tell people in my life that I will find them a quarter if they use the term the media. It just doesn't exist. There is no the media. Right. Um, but if you look at different, different kinds of media, you find pretty significant trust in local news. And so local news is, a, is such an important part of all this. What kinds of public service journalism should these outlets be doing? Um, I, you know, we, we all know the horrible constraints of local news right now, but in a perfect world, um, what sorts of public interest journalism are really gonna matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we talked about the concept of the pre-bunk earlier. I think that's really the most useful things reporters can do right now. Um, on a related note, there's this thing that we call uh, filling data voids, um, which is which you can read more about in the toolkit at a pretty great length. But it's basically you anticipate questions that your audiences will have about the election, maybe like the security of voting by mail or 
whether it's safe to vote in person during the pandemic. And then you produce public service journalism with those questions in mind. Like ideally, in a perfect world, you want your story to be the first thing that, perps that pops up when um, somebody in your area types in one of those questions into Google. Um, you, you want to reach them before, before they find the junk news site or the uh, Facebook grant that kind of plants a falsehood in their mind. So who has some questions for us? Please, again, go ahead and type them in the chat um, to all panelists and attendees, because we'd, we'd love to hear from you um, what your experiences are um, sort of on the ground, what, um, what concerns you, <laughs> what you should be uh, focusing on um, right now. One of the things I know is top of everyone's mind is, of course, the election looming in, what, 38 days, 37 days, something like that. Um, <laughs> I'd have to go, I'd have to go to my calendar and actually count. Um, but we, for all intents and purposes, should be looking at uncharted waters here. What is, um, you know, what happens when we don't have a result on election night, which a lot of experts are predicting is exactly what's going to happen given the number of absentee or mail-in balloting. Uh, what happens if someone, um, you know, if, uh, if Joe Biden or Donald Trump rejects the outcome of the election? Um, what, would, what advice do you give to news outlets when it comes to th that specific issue, a contested mm -hmm. election? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I, I think we all know how different this election cycle has been and how much is at stake in terms of the like long term health of uh, the American experiment. Um, so I think it's really, really, really important to prep our audiences not to expect results on the night of the election and that it's almost certainly going to be like one of the most hotly contested elections, uh, elections that, you know, has ever happened, or at least in recent memory. Um, like it took several days for Wisconsin elections officials to count all the mail ballots just during the August partisan primary. And we can expect at least a similar delay this time around, if not longer, considering the, the volume of ballots. And um, that's a really problematic like window of time that everybody's anticipating. Um, you can guarantee that disinformation is going to be flying like crazy and it's just going to be extremely hotly contested. So just again, I'm just going to beat this drum of getting out in front of these rumors and hoaxes is the best option for reporters who are dedicated to telling the truth and preserving American democracy as we know it. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a, it's a good soapbox to be on. I mean, that's what, that's what we're about, right? Uh, you know, people, people attack journalists and journalism in the United States now more than ever. Um, but there is no denying its centrality to a democracy. Um, there's absolutely no denying it. So let me turn to some questions here from the chat. Um, this is from I, I, either Callie Pittman or Holly Pittman. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Uh, what is your advice for handling social media comments slash trolls who parrot extremist information? Do you just ban them? Do you respond back? It's like playing whack-a-mole. We do not have a web or social media editor, so cannot always catch them immediately. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the most difficult things to grapple with um, as a reporter who's looking into this stuff is that you can't possibly address the, all of the misinformation that, that you come across. It's like overwhelming thinking about um, how much of the stuff you can't get to. Um, the, the pace and volume of of the falsehoods are, are just overwhelming. So you really have to choose your battles. Um, and I think that's where measuring the tipping point um, and considering community harm really come in handy because then you really start realizing that not all that much of the content rises to that occasion. Like it's a pretty high bar to clear and um, it doesn't happen as often as you would think where you can really argue that you're seeing this same falsehood on multiple platforms. You're seeing it on Facebook and Reddit and Twitter simultaneously. It seems to have a life of its own you can't even really figure out where it started. Um, those are the really alarming uh, instances and they don't, uh, they just don't happen as often as you'd suspect. So that's another hardening aspect of reporting on misinformation is that you don't have to report on all of it. And in fact, you should not report on all of it because it's really just like drawing more attention to um, bad information. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to add two things to that. So one, I just put into the chat um, a, a link to an excellent report um, called The Oxygen of Amplification. Um, mm -hmm. It deals with mis and disinformation, particularly in the arena of hate speech and um, some considerations, particularly for news outlets about when to address these sorts of things. The other thing I would say is if you're, if the comments, um, you know, the trolls and the misinformation are being um, appended to stories, I think there is a good case for removing those comments, um, at least from what research tells us. So, um, you know, there's some, some studies showing that um, incorrect comments, you know, it, a perfectly fine story um, in, let's say, the realm of um, nanotechnology, um, if there are incorrect comments appended to that story, it can adversely affect audiences' understanding of the issue. Um, we know um, from research in the J School, the School of Journalism, for instance, um, that negative comments on a YouTube video of a news story or an event um, can create what's called this nasty effect that people um, people remember the negative or misinformation more than they remember the actual reported story. So I think you have a basis um, for removing those kinds of comments uh, because they're not in the public interest. When it comes to banning people, it's a little bit more difficult because um, you see then the tremendous blowback from that and um, the accusations of partisanship. So that takes us to our next uh, question, which, which comes from Frank Zufall, and this relates directly to what I was just saying about partisanship. Um, I have several reports and official complaints of Biden and Democrat signs being stolen and defaced, but no official confirmation or even social media reports of Trump or Republican signs being damaged or stolen. The question is how to report this and not appear partisan or biased, um, like it is only one side being impacted by the other, but appears but it appears from what I know, official complaints and social media reports, only one side is being targeted. So Howard, how would you deal with that kind of, uh, that kind of issue? I mean, when you have reports on one side, you can't engage in both sidesism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is a tricky uh, kind of gray area. But I will add that I have tracked uh, specifically a lot of, uh, of uh, social media posts regarding uh, the removal of Trump signs, um, allegedly by um, uh, mail carriers. That's been like a really big theme of the misinformation that I've tracked in Western Wisconsin, and also kind of like spilling over uh, across the border to Minnesota. It's been a really big talking point, and I'd be happy to hook up with you and um, share some insights uh, on that specific subject if you'd like. That reminds me, um, Howard, you should put into the chat um, for not just panelists, but all panelists and attendees, um, your email address if you're open to contact from people who want, um, you know, more information beyond the toolkit or want suggestions. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, Howard, you sent that to all panelists. I need you to send it to all panelists and attendees. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's it's one of those it's one of those little Zoom things that we should be able to check a box and make that not happen, but unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. There we go. Um, yeah, I I think um, in your um, is it Frank? I think one of the questions um, or one of the approaches you could use would be to report the story in your local context. I don't know where you are, but if what you're hearing in your local context. Um, is that it's only um, signs for Democratic candidates and, and Joe Biden that are being stolen, you could put it in a larger context of, you know, complaints about this happening elsewhere, and maybe even include links to um, the idea that's percolating. Again, I agree with Howard in, in Western Wisconsin and Minnesota, a lot of, you know, claims of postal worker malfeasance and stealing of signs, and, mm -hmm. you know, show how those have been um, debunked. It's a, I agree with you that um, it's, we always run the risk of being, uh, you know, claimed to have partisan leanings one way or another, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore um, those stories, even though they, they tilt one way or another. It's something that has actually um, really plagued fact checkers um, because um, when they do fact checks, they tend to find um, more incorrect information coming from the right than from the left. And so the argument is, well, the fact checkers are biased, but the fact checkers would argue, well, no, we're, we're investigating all claims of um, misinformation, but it's tilting one way and that's beyond our control. How about other questions? Any, anyone else have a question?
I'd also just, since we have everybody still out, also just really like to emphasize that um, through my fellowship with First Draft and also as a reporter with Wisconsin Watch, I'm super open to any and all uh, inquiries. If you're if you're seeing anything on social media that you don't quite know what to make of, please uh, reach out to me. Super um, open to helping you analyze and understand that uh, content. And even when it's over my head, I have like a huge organization full of really wonderful researchers who I can um, who I can ping and we can definitely get back to you. So just putting that out yeah. there. You know what, Hard, I think that is so critically important because, you know, we, we know our newsrooms are smaller. We know we're losing um, that all important labor at the local level, but now more than ever, there are those resources. Um, you know, this, this toolkit is, is one of exactly those efforts um, to say, look, there's, there's research being done. We know a lot about misinformation. You don't have to, um, you don't have to verify it yourself. You're not alone in the wilderness. You're part of a larger community that wants to protect citizens' rights. Um, they, we want to ensure that everyone has their power within this democracy. So that's, you know, that's what this toolkit was about, you know, sort of being a bridge between industry and, and what we know on a larger national level. I should mention the toolkit also links to other resources. Um, there's a PEN America um, uh, like one sheeter on how to uh, deal with all of this. So it's really, um, it's really thorough. It's long, but you know, take the time, take the time to read it. As I mentioned, um, we'll send all the attendees and registrants a follow-up email with links to resources. Um, and here is Krista with our final wrap up. If anybody has a final question, that's fine, put it in the, um, put it in the chat and we'll definitely address it. Um, but in addition to the reporter's toolkit, we have what we think is a really, really important second effort. And that is um, a toolkit for consumers of information. So we want to um, give citizens the ability to figure out how do I, how do I know if something is missing disinformation. How can I navigate this world of social media? Uh, what if someone in my life is spreading um, disinformation and I really want to have Thanksgiving dinner with them and not correct them? Um, how can those citizens, um, how can those citizens um, navigate this world and find their way through it? I have to say, I don't, I don't know about the rest of you, but to me, um, I have tremendous empathy for voters in this time because there's never in my life um, been this kind of information chaos. I think it is a very difficult time uh, for mm -hmm. people to know what is true and what is not true. And I think that's, I think that's really unfortunate. And, and maybe, maybe also worth, um, you know, you're covering, you're doing sort of a, a um, hey, we, we know how hard this is for you, but here's where you can find um, valid information. Um, so we would love to have any and all help in promoting this um, to citizens in your um, in your coverage area. You'll see at the bottom um, the URL go.wisc.edu slash integrity. That goes right to um, the toolkits. And again, we'll put that out in an email to all of you as well. Um, but also to say that, you know, if you're doing these kinds of um, pre-bunk stories or, you know, helping citizens navigate social media kinds of stories, um, you always should feel more than welcome to contact Howard, me, there are other experts in our School of Journalism and Mass Communication who are very, very dedicated to responding to news media requests for interviews, offering expertise, and always doing so in a nonpartisan way. That's one of the most important aspects of this toolkit is that, you know, we're not going for any particular result in an election. We just want citizens' interests to be served. They are, after all, who we are all here for. So if you ever need anything in terms of reporting or, you know, wanting an expert to do a radio interview or, you know, a Zoom interview, whatever, um, we're happy to be the conduit to get you to um, those experts. And that's not just here in Wisconsin, too. That's at, that's at the national level as well. There are a lot of people very focused on, on you know, how to ensure the integrity of this election and citizens' confidence in the results. 
So with that, these are the these are a few resources. Um, if you want to take a screenshot, you're welcome to, but we'll follow up with that email for you. We are so grateful to um, Wisconsin Watch, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism for partnering with us on this, um, as well as First Draft as another partner and the Craig Newmark Philanthropies for their support of the project. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank you, Howard. You have done such incredible incredibly hard work um, on this toolkit. I think you've created something of lasting value um, to, to reporters, to editors, news directors, publishers. Um, really appreciate um, all, that you, all the work that you've put into it. And I, and I look forward to hearing from any and all of you. Um, and please, if you have friends and other news outlets, share with them too. Not everybody can attend a webinar. Um, we would just love to have this go out as, and provide as much value as it can possibly provide. So thank you to everyone. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Really appreciate it. And the person